when I was a kid, maybe 12 years old or so, I performed in a Palm Sunday musical in my church. The play was about Theodolf of Orléans, a 9th century bishop, theologian, and poet who did time in the clink because the king of France suspected he might have been part of an attempted coup. According to the story, while Theodolf was in prison, he, he wrote a hymn that was so beautiful that when the king heard Theodolf singing this hymn as the royal entourage passed on the street under the bishop's cell, the king was moved to compassion. And he released the prisoner, and he declared that henceforth, folks would sing that beautiful hymn each Palm Sunday. The hymn was All Glory, Laud, and Honor, which, in unwitting compliance with the ancient decree of Louis the Pious, King of the Franks, and all of Aquitaine, we have sung together today. In that play, I, I played the role of a jailer. It was the pinnacle of my career as an actor in musical theater. Now, most of the story of the hymn All Glory, Laud, and Honor is legend. The only thing that we know for sure is historically accurate is that Theodolf of Orléans did, in fact, write the hymn while he was in jail. The rest is speculation. And the version of the hymn we sing today, well, it sounds nothing like it would have sounded 1,200 years ago. But still, it is a good story. And in many ways, it is a story that is consistent with an interpretation of the Palm Sunday story that I first encountered maybe eight years ago, shortly before I came to Montclair Presbyterian Church, when I started paying closer attention to the scholarship of the Jesus Seminar. People like Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan, who in his book, God and Empire, suggested that Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the event that we call Palm Sunday, he suggested that that was actually a bit of political street theater. According to Crossan's interpretation of the story, Jesus and his followers were poking fun at how the Roman imperial army used to process into Jerusalem. Each year, at the time of the Passover, when Jewish patriotism was at its strongest, the Roman governor would make a big show of marching into Jerusalem with the intent of scaring the people out of any thought of rebellion. When the Romans arrived, they came with trumpets blaring and, and, and with people cheering, often because they were paid to cheer, but the people would be cheering saying things like, Hooray for Rome! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of Caesar. The local governor, Pontius Pilate in this case, would ride astride a powerful war horse or maybe riding in a military chariot, and the Romans would have entered the city from the west. So Jesus well, got on a donkey, or a colt in some versions of the story, and he rode down the hill and into Jerusalem from the east, while his disciples waved palm branches and shouted, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, and generally made fools of themselves while making an important political statement. His followers' praises, well, they weren't just about proclaiming Jesus king. They were about lampooning the empire, which, you know, powerful people being notoriously thin-skinned, political satire, especially if it's done well, is a particularly effective tool for speaking truth to power. Now, I love this take on the story of Jesus' triumphal entry, but I wasn't there. I don't really know if it is accurate. I have no idea why Jesus and his followers actually pulled this stunt. Crossan's take on, on Palm Sunday may be just as mythic or legendary as the story of the hymn, All Glory, Lot, and Honor, getting Theodolf released from jail. But here's what I like about both of these stories. What I will like about them, even if someone can prove them to be fanciful and lacking in historical credibility, I like these two stories because they're about people responding to great adversity with creativity. Whether it's a wrongly accused bishop or a savior entering the city that he knows will be his place of death, in both stories, or rather in the old French legend and in the modern interpretation of an ancient biblical text, in both cases... Rather than giving in to despair, the protagonists become artists, and their art had a lasting impression. And that is exactly what we need today. We face a lot of challenges as a society. We are in what I hope is the, are the final months of a pandemic. We're, we're trying to pick up the pieces of our country's close encounter with neo-fascism, and we have ongoing work to be done around economic inequality, a lack of affordable housing, systemic racism, violence against women, violence against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. We still have a long way to go in the work of creating a society that 
fully integrates and empowers gay men and lesbians, trans women and men, and those whose sexuality and gender identities fall outside of the strict binary. Women still earn 80 cents for each dollar a man earns. The United States is still lacking, is still locking immigrant children in cages. And since I last recorded a sermon video, there have been two mass shootings in the United States and common sense reform to our nation's gun laws still seems somewhat out of reach. I just listed a whole bunch of issues that may never get resolved in my lifetime and I haven't even begun to scratch the surface. To the things that I've just mentioned at climate change, prison reform, a more just funding for public education, the reform of American policing, the, the preservation of America's topsoil, the honoring of tribal rights. The list is endless. There is so much to do, so far to travel, and with every step we take, there will be resistance. The empire will strike back. While speaking truth, we will get pushback. And of course, none of this is easy. Most challenges we face would not be challenges at all if there were simple solutions. It takes work. And as we do the work, as we march to our own Jerusalem, whatever that is for us, my prayer is that we will bring an extra measure of creativity to our work of faithfulness. It may be something as simple as wearing a stylish or funny face mask when we go out in public. Or, or, or I think a great example of what I'm talking about here are the videos that our congregation's Earth Care Task Force has been making to let us know about climate change issues. These videos are creative, they're well made, they're often funny, and, and they communicate important truths. They're wonderful. Like, I don't know what it's like for you, but I spend a lot of time trying to read and to understand books by philosophers and theologians and social critics and historians, and a lot of what they have to say is really good and really important, but I also confess that I am more likely to be inspired to action by musicians and novelists, poets, filmmakers, painters, dancers, comedians, and other creative types. That creative artistic response is where ideas become actions and where obligations become joyful tasks. And so dearly beloved, when I, when I hear the story of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, I will continue to think of Jesus and his disciples performing a bit of, of political theater and when I sing All Glory, Laud, and Honor, I will remember the story of a medieval bishop singing God's praises from jail. And when, I, and when I look out into the world with all of its problems, I will do my best to join Theodore of Orléans and the disciples and Jesus himself in creating an artistic response to the challenges we face together. And I hope you will join me. Amen. <laughs>